Welcome to this episode of my little Haskell screencast. In the last one, I got a submission from a viewer, namely Daniel Diaz posted on Twitter that it would be nice to look at the zip function. And not just the normal one from the prelude, but also one based on hyperfunctions. And he pointed me to a blog post by Ashin Kidney. So that was very interesting. I had a look at that. And let's do that. So on the left, we have zip, the normal definition. On the right, we have gh ghci. And let's um, define a, a few uh, lists here. So x, x is, is let's try that again. Um, one with lowercase, one with uppercase, so that we can tell them apart. And maybe let's make this shorter. And then we also want to zip xs and ys. And now we can use ghcvis to look our list. So check out, um, look at our list. So here's xs, here's ys, the two linked lists as we would expect them. And here is zx. Okay, it's gonna be a bit messy in the beginning, but let's evaluate the first element. And now we see, and quite as expected, uh, the zipping of two lists means there's a thunk, because we haven't looked at the full list yet, and it refers to the corresponding elements of the first and the second list. And as I evaluate this thunk, we get more of these tuple elements, and these tuple elements actually point, of course, to the elements of the original list. So we get new list elements, we get new tuples, but the values are naturally shared. And not, not much else is going on. We can evaluate the thunk all the way down. And at the end, we have um, three lists and the elements appear in, in two lists, either directly or in tuple. So that's uh, GHGVis for now. Um, let's now look at what is hyperfunctions and, and what does zip have to do with it. And maybe the starting point is more like a puzzle. Let's try to rewrite zip so that we are using two write folds over the lists. So it's rather straightforward to um, change this type, de this definition of zip into one that does a write fold over the left list, the first argument. But doing it over both, actually quite a challenge. And I encourage you to take uh, a pause now and maybe try it on your own. Um, but if not, um, you can follow me along and I'll try to, to write this. So the goal is to write zip of x's and y's as two folds, one over x's and one over y's. I'm not gonna bother writing folder because we all know the kind of functions that would be a folder. So instead we're gonna call them foo and bar. So somehow we have to fold foo and we have to fold bar with appropriate ways. And let's put them into our little local functions here. So, and we want them to be right folds. They have to have the following shape. We do something for the empty list and we do something for the non-empty list. And the thing we do for the non-empty list can do whatever it wants, but it has to recurse through foo. And then the same thing for bar. This is the general shape of, um, of a right fold. And whenever we have a function that looks like this, we know we can write it with folder into arguments and I'm not gonna bother with that for the purpose of this talk. Okay, so, so foo has, and then, okay, what do we do with these two lists? Uh, well, these two results from foo and bar? I don't really know yet, but let's just try the functional thing and let's just try to pass the result of the second, of bar x, uh, bar ys, to the first function. For the first function, so we get something, we don't know what it is, something, something strange. Actually, let's, uh, um, yeah, let's try the type secret here. So this is gonna take some a and then some, uh, we don't really know yet, let's make an underscore. Um, and then it's gonna returning the, whatever we want from the zip. And the bar thing, okay, that's gonna take the list of b's and returns one of these we don't know yet. Okay, so this takes a function, and this is gonna be a function that takes one of these we don't know yet, and it definitely gonna just ignore it because when the first list is empty, we're done. For the second one, we probably have to do something with this. Let's just call it R. And I don't really know what it will do, but it certainly will do something with um, with foo access and 
and also the element x. So I'm just pushing it now, like the problem further down. I'm just passing the result of the recursive call and the current element to R, and we'll leave it to, to that thing. Okay, so in the bar case, well, okay, we just found out that this thing that we return here is probably gonna be a function. And it, we actually know what it's gonna be a function of. It's gonna be a function of this thing, which I'm gonna be calling, um, well, it's the result of the recursive call of foo, so it's gonna be the completely zip list, x, y, s, and then also the element x. But really, if, if the second list is empty, we're done. We can just return the empty list. So the interesting case again is this one here. Um, and so what happens here? Now we have an x. Oh, this should of course be y and y. So now we have an x and a y. So probably this is the point we're going to start doing, um, start building out a zip list. And then we want to recurse. And to recurse, well, we have to do something with bar x's. And we have to have, we have this thing here. And this is quite of a brain twister here, but this x, y, s thingy is the thing we pass here. Foo x, s, it's foo applied to one argument. So it's actually a function that returns, ah, it returns a zip, a zip list. So we probably want to call this here. But, but it's a function and we have to pass it one of these. Well, these are the things we produce. So likely we can just pass bar x that there and that should be y. Okay, let's see what GHGI thinks about that. Ooh, uh, can it construct the infinite type and found a wildcard? Okay, the wildcard is fine. We can, we can ignore this for a moment just to get less confusing error messages. And yeah, can it construct infinite types? So maybe this actually kind of works, but Haskell doesn't have infinite types. I don't really know why we have infinite types here. But uh, there's something that this blog post by Sheen told me. Um, when you have an error message like this, don't take it as you're doing something wrong. Just take it as, oh, that's kind of the shape of thing you may want to define as a new type, because new types allow you to be recursive. So let's write a new type Z. It takes two arguments, A and B probably, likely. And then it's going to be a constructor and it's going to be a run Z. And now we can just paste uh, the right hand side of this equality. Okay, that doesn't quite line up because the different um, uh, names for the type variables here, but surely we want to return something that's a zip list. Okay, that looks good. So this must be A and this must be A and then this must be B. And this is the T that was on the left, look, look here on the error message. This is the whole thing. So this clearly needs to be ZAB. Okay, so this is probably the magic thing that we have to put into the type signatures here and here. Now, this doesn't quite compile yet, but that's just because now we have this new type and we have to wrap it in various places. So here we're not returning a function, we're returning a function that's wrapped into the C thing. So let's do this here and here. Um, and then here, we, this is the place where we want to use this thing. So we have to take it out again. And it compiles. We've successfully rewritten the zip function using two write faults. Now, what does this to do with hyperfunctions? Now, I'm not going to make this into a full tutorial about hyperfunctions. I don't even know that much about them myself, but uh, just a little glimpse. So um, a hyperfunction is uh, this new type. So we have a new function error that we introduce here, and we need to have um, constructors and accesses, but this is really just a recursive type. That's the reason why we have the new type. And the right-hand side of this is, well, it returns a B and it takes not an A, but rather an B to A. So let's, let's see what this does. So if I have a hyperfunction like this and I unroll it once, oh, this should of course be the hyperfunction, otherwise it's kind of boring. Um, and then I can unroll it again. 
So this is now a, well, it returns an A, becomes a null function error, and the left is an A hyper function to, to B. Um, he arranged it a little bit differently. Okay, what does this have to do with Z? Well, if we squint closely, unrolling this twice, this new type, um, we get something that kind of matches what we have here. So I, I claim that we can have um, Z, A, B, and that we can line this up with the above. So Z, A, B, well, we want to have, let's start from the right. So we want to return, um, So yeah, one. Sorry. Let, let's start with let's start with the right the definition here. And we want to kind of match these two up. Now the first thing here we can do is we can parenthesize the right hand side of this arrow so that we have a chance of matching these arrows. So we know that um, Z A B could be if this works out a um, hyper function that returns on the right hand side. Uh, this thing. Okay, so then, um, then what is A? Well, A could be this expression here. And if you look at what's happening here, well, we've unwrapped it twice. So this CAB again. Well, that's just what we started with. So yes, we were able to, to just ignoring the type, uh, the, the constructors, see that our ZAB is really just an instance of this hyper function. And that means we could take this code and give it a new name. And instead of ZAB, write this type here. Now, previously we had, well, maybe replacing one new type by another one that have, we have to unroll twice. So very likely GHG will tell us we have to use a few more um, type constructors and, and things here, but actually quite simple. So this is now one of these hyper functions. And when we use the output of foo, we also have to use invoke. Oh, and then of course also the other things here need to be changed. This is actually hip, not z. And here we use the output of, of foo, so we have to use invoke. And it doesn't quite like it yet. So let me peek a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, small mistake. Um, this thing here, where we, we replaced, we didn't make a mistake, we replaced z, a, b with whatever the right hand side, but this is actually, again, the hyper function once unrolled. So we could just go back one level, and now it compiles. And this is actually pretty pretty, because now foo and bar are very symmetric. And it would be kind of strange if zipping two lists becomes some, something that's not symmetric. So this is zip written with two hyper functions and two folders. So how does this now look in memory? Back to the original question. Well, let's define our lists. I'm going to use in zip3. Let's fire up ghgbis. So it looks similar, but there's a notable difference. We see now that the list that we generate, well, it depends on the other two lists as before, but there's no more than one thunk involved. Previously, there was one thunk uh, that would look at both of the heads, and now there's a second thunk. And we can kind of make sense of that. This here, the thing that goes over this, the, the first list, that is the hyper function that goes over with foo. And if you just follow this thunk, 
we oh something else happens on previously we get a function and we can't do anything more because it's not a function we have to do something else so if you look at the first thunk okay this was a little bit different than i expected okay let's but that's okay um what we see is we, it's almost the same thing there's one thunk that kind of refers to the two lists it's split into two things kind of where the second one and this should just be the um, application of um, of bar to foo probably so this so this fungus really just takes the list and returns a new lambda which is I think this we almost see here this line um, but otherwise it has the same laziness properties we can still go through it step by step and at the end the list looks the same now I'm kind of curious whether zip2 would have looked different Lee. So let's look at zip2. So indeed, zip2 looks a little bit different. There's now a thunk that refers to a function directly. And there's nothing else we can do here besides walk down that, um, that tree. So kind of as expected, just because the zip function no matter whether you do it as explicitly or with folders has its certain laziness properties so it'll always be a kind of thunk that refers to the other lists and walks them down um, as we go so with that um i hope you liked this episode i found it very interesting myself to learn something about hyper functions it's kind of cute it's kind of a mind twister and if you want to read more about it, I'll put links to the blog post that I took this inspiration from into the channel description. And if you want to hear something else or something new, let me know and we can do more of these. Goodbye.